I appeal for a stepped-up international effort led by the Security Council to achieve a global ceasefire by the end of this year. We have 100 days, as I said, the clock is ticking. The world needs a global ceasefire to stop all hot conflicts. But at the same time, we must do everything to avoid a new Cold War. We are moving in a very dangerous direction. Our world cannot afford a future where the two largest economies split the globe in a great fracture, each with its own trade and financial rules and internet and artificial intelligence capacities. A technological and economic divide risks inevitably turning into a geostrategic and military divide, and we must avoid this at all costs. We have seen when countries go in their own direction, the virus goes in every direction. We must act in solidarity. Far too little assistance has been extended to countries with the fewest capacities to face the challenge. And we must be guided by science and tethered to reality. Populism and nationalism have failed. Those approaches to contain the virus have often made things manifestly worse. Too often, there has also been a disconnect between leadership and power. We see remarkable examples of leadership, but they are not usually associated with power. And power is not always associated with the necessary leadership. In an interconnected world, it is time to recognize a simple truth. Solidarity is self-interest. If we fail to grasp that fact, everyone loses. Excellencies, as the pandemic took hold, I called for a global ceasefire. Today, I appeal for a new push by the international community to make this a reality by the end of this year. We have exactly 100 days. There is only one winner of conflict during a pandemic, the virus itself. Considering that we have not yet overcome the pandemic crisis, we should try to use the institutions and mechanisms we have for multilateral cooperation in the most effective way. Where problems are global, local solutions can only save the day. International solidarity is essential for long-term solutions. In Turkey, since the early days of the outbreak of the crisis, we have called for cooperation in all international platforms. We have been in the forefront of efforts to combat the pandemic in the G20, the Turkic Council, MICTA, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, and other platforms. We reached out to 146 countries and seven international organizations that requested medical equipment assistance with the understanding that a sure friend is known in unsure times. With the repatriation operations we carried out, we ensured the return of more than 100,000 of our citizens in 141 countries to their homes. With the same flights, we carried more than 5,500 foreigners from 67 countries to their homes. We did not do all these things with the intention of carrying out a coronavirus diplomacy. We did not expect and still do not hope for any compensation from anyone for our aid and repatriation efforts. Standing with the victims and the oppressed is in the veins of our nation and in the essence of our enterprising and humanitarian foreign policy. I once again call for the supply of medical equipment and drugs and vaccine development efforts not to be made an issue of competition. No matter which country they are produced in, vaccines to be made ready for use should be offered to the common benefit of humanity. Dear delegates, with the pandemic, we have once again experienced together how vital elements such as state capacity, effective governance, and resilience are. The Korean people protected their own safety by protecting that of neighbors. The Korean government extended the scope of neighbors beyond its borders. By sharing infectious disease prevention equipment with other countries without closing borders, Korea is keeping our country and economy intact. 
we learned that in the end, what empowers Korea to weather the novel coronavirus was the very values cultivated by humanity and championed by the UN. The answer to overcoming COVID-19 is not far from us. It lies in returning to the spirit of the UN Charter, that is, believing in universal values of humankind. And it lies in marching toward a more inclusive world through multilateral action. The far-sighted leaders in the past created the UN dreaming of a better world and achieved a brilliant feat of promoting universal values of humankind. In the post-COVID-19 era, the UN should be tasked with spreading these universal values even further to resolve complex global challenges such as cooperation in healthcare, economic cooperation for sustainable development, and climate action. The battles each and every country has been fighting this year have clearly demonstrated that the crisis cannot be overcome by a single country alone or without consideration of neighbors. Today, with the UN assuming a new job in the post-COVID-19 era, I'd like to address the importance of strengthening inclusiveness in international cooperation, a way to shape multilateralism in a way that makes everyone prosperous. Mr. President, strengthening inclusiveness in international cooperation means leaving no one behind and achieving shared prosperity where everyone enjoys freedom. Domestically, it is reducing inequalities to ensure safety of one's own and sustainable development together with neighbors. Internationally, it is taking into account the conditions and circumstances neighboring countries are put in while working with them to attain co-prosperity. Nothing is more important than life and safety of humanity. Of one person now requires cooperation that transcends borders, we need to equip ourselves with a multilateral security architecture. So far, I have spoken about a peace economy that benefits both Koreas and makes everyone prosperous, and stressed the need for inter-Korean cooperation in disaster response and health care. Hoping that the international community views the issues surrounding the Korean Peninsula through the lens of more inclusive international cooperation, I propose today launching a Northeast Asia Cooperation Initiative for Infectious Disease Control and Public Health, whereby North Korea participates as a member along with China, Japan, Mongolia, and the Republic of Korea. A cooperative architecture that guarantees collective protection of life and safety will lay the ground for North Korea to have its security guaranteed by engaging with the international community. In particular, this year marks the 17th anniversary of the outbreak of the Korean War. Time has come to remove the tragedy lingering on the Korean Peninsula. The war must end completely and for good. And a middle-income country whose economic advantages have been derailed by the pandemic, we welcome the launch of the UN COVID Response and Recovery Fund, ensuring universal access to anti-COVID-19 technologies and products is pivotal in the global pandemic recovery. The world is in the race to find safe and effective vaccine. When the world finds that vaccine, access to it must not be denied nor withheld. It should be made available to all rich and poor nations alike as a matter of policy. The Philippines joins our partners in the ASEAN and the non-aligned movement and in raising our collective voice the COVID-19 vaccine must be considered a global public good. COVID-19 knows no border. It knows no nationality. It knows no race. It knows no gender. It knows no age. It knows no creed.